I'm going to put the slides up then, so. So good evening, everyone. You have me tonight and your guests to enjoy the chat uh, with a cuppa. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to a lovely lady, Muriel McCauley, who I first met, and she probably doesn't remember this, back about 2014 or 2015, uh, Hugo McGuinness and Joe Mooney did a walk around the Battle of Ainsley Bridge. And one of our group, Ashling, came running over to me going, Thomas McDonough's granddaughter is here. And of course, I wanted an introduction. So we had a very brief hello because she was very much in demand that day. Uh, fast forward probably two years. Um, and I went to a book launch in Richmond Barracks in the gym before they restored it. Um, and next thing, who do I see? I'm sitting beside but Muriel McCauley. So we had a, a very nice little brief chat. And she's a charming lady with a wonderful family story. And I think uh, very appropriate for this census week when we're looking to people and what they'll read about us 100 years from now, I think it'd be very interesting to hear uh, the story of Muriel and Thomas McDonough from 100, just over 100 years ago. So thank you very much, Muriel, for giving up your time. Um, I'm happy to move through the slides as you give me the nod. Um, as you come across the photo, just say next, Christine, and I'll move it forward for you, okay? Thanks, Muriel. So I'm, I'm just, uh, just appreciate you doing this. I'm very happy to do it. Um, please excuse me reading from a script. Uh, otherwise, I go around in, in the wrong sort of circles. I'm sure you're all relatively familiar with what happened in the Rising, which has taken place over 100 years ago now. Perhaps I can give you a small insight into just a couple of the personalities involved, most, most particularly some of my own relatives. In the 1870s, my great grandparents Joseph and Mary Louise McDonough uh, were invited to, uh, to, to open a new national school in the village of Clock Jordan in County Tipperary. And it was there that most of the family, including Thomas, were born. The house where they grew up is now a heritage center with a library attached. Joseph was the son of an old Stein style Fenian called uh, Red, uh, known as Red Pat McDonough. He was a farmer who also uh, it could be described as uh, had what we could be described as a hedge school on his farm. He used a barn as a school for the local children uh, who at that time were denied entry to a formal school and he taught them there. So education was definitely in the genes. Red Pat died when Joseph was, was quite young. I think he was in his early teens. Somebody had realized that he was fairly bright. I think he'd helped with some of the teaching. And it was arranged that he would go to teacher training college, probably in Dublin. And it was there that he met his future wife, Mary Louise Burroughs. Her father was English and had been invited to go to work in Trinity College's Greek department, if you don't mind, both as a printer and as a reader. When I heard that first, I thought it meant that he was a proofreader but, uh, for the books that he was printing uh, but, uh, for them. But I've since been told that it was a type of lecturer. He was also very interested in music, as was his daughter. And when Mary Louise went to Clock Jordan, she brought her piano with her, uh, on which she gave music lessons to the, the children. It's been restored and physically it's, it looks great, but it badly needs uh, to be tuned and that's a major job this is that's the uh, piano and uh, it, it, it's a major and very expensive job i've heard they both settled well into 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 the village joseph uh, taught the boys and mary louise taught the girls i was in clock jordan in 1966 actually at easter and heard that uh, at that time that mary louise used the times to set one of the girls to sit on a stile and watch out in case an inspector decided to, to call. And then, uh, and then she, Mary Louise would teach the girls rebel songs. This suggests that like many immigrants over the, the centuries, she had taken up the culture of her new country wholeheartedly. She certainly was a convert to Catholicism and instilled her new faith into all her children. McDonough certainly loved the area and many of his poems uh, reflect the surrounding area and its way of life, sometimes in a more complimentary way than others. 
I understand that he was quite prone at times to meet from school because he wanted to go looking around the countryside. Uh, sorry, I've lost, lost track. Uh, he must also have been a reason, a reasonable student, though, because of in, because in due course he went to Rockwell College near Cashel after the death of Joseph, his father. In those days, there were no uh, free secondary education, and I imagine that the fees uh, were substantial for such a boarding school. I don't know if he was granted a scholarship because he showed promise or that his parents were teachers, which sometimes happened. In either case, he seemed to take to the life of the school and in due course actually applied to become a scholastic, someone who would later go on to become a priest of the Holy Ghost Father Order as the spiritans were known then, and hopefully in his mind, a missionary. This may well have been influenced by his mother. It was regarded as a mark of special status if those uh, in those days to have an, a priest and a nun in the family and one of, uh, McDonough's sisters, Mary, I think his eldest sister, did actually become a nun and took the name of Sister Francesca. As a scholastic, in addition to his own studies, he also taught in Rockwell. But after some time, in particular after the tragic death of a close friend, he decided that he was not suited to become a priest and asked to be released from his application. As he had taken no vows, this was granted. And shortly afterwards, he moved to Kilkenny to take, teach in St. Kieran's College there. And it's relevant that a, a letter of reference from Rockwell was highly complimentary and recommended him very much. It was in Kilkenny that a number of life changing things happened. He was sharing digs uh, with another young man, Francis Skeffington, who, when he married, did what was very unusual thing of taking his new wife's surname as part of his. his and both became Sheehy Skeppington. Frank was a committed pacifist and also a promoter of votes for women, revolutionary in those days. They did, however, remain friends, even when their approach to life sometimes changed. I've lost where I was. Sorry, I, I, I missed a page. Um, Conor Gaelga uh, also ca uh, uh, called him a meeting in Kilkenny. McDonough and some of his friends decided to go along, not really to support the idea. In fact, I sus suspect that they would have been inclined to mock. But that was not the way it turned out. When he hears what they, uh, they say, it's something of a road to Damascus con uh, conversion. According to himself, he had been rather West Brit up to that time. But now he saw the point of what Conrad and Gaelga, the Gaelic League, was promoting, an Irish Ireland supporting Irish language and culture. He took to it with enthusiasm, helped to found the Kilkenny branch of the League, and became uh, the first secretary, went to the Aran Islands to learn Irish and uh, promoted the whole idea. He even tried to have Irish added to the curriculum in St. Kieran's, but they were having none of it. This brought about parting of the ways, and he moved to teach in St. Coleman's College in Promoy, where they did. He continued with his work uh, there, promoting the Irish language and culture, and can, continued to vin uh, visit Aran. There, in particular, on Inish Man, he was known by two names, Far on uh, because he brought the first bicycle they had seen on the island, and the man who stayed up all night with a sick cow. This arose because a cow belonging to one of the islanders was having trouble calving, and he spent the night helping. I'm told that both cow, a cow and calf survived, very important, economically in an area where the loss of one, uh, either the cow or the calf, let alone both, would have been catastrophic. It was also in Aaron that he met Paul at Pierce, and, and they became friends. So it was that when Pierce decided to open St. Enders, first in Cullenswood House, in Renla, McDonough went to teach there and become his second in command. Uh, the school was very unusual in, the, in its time. It was very student centered. It was multilingual subjects were taught both in Irish and in English, and they were also learned French. As a detail at mealtimes, instead of the teachers sitting at a top table, one teacher sat at each table with the boys. 
He learned too about the old Irish traditions and frequently put on plays and pageants uh, that were related. At times there were open days and it was one of these that my grandparents met for the first time. A leading suffragist uh, brought a couple of the Gifford sisters, Muriel and I think Grace, to the school. Possibly John was there as well, which now moved to the hermitage in Rathbarnham. As they approached the house, I'm told that Pierce and McDonough were standing on the steps. And that Pierce turned to McDonough and said, uh, you should marry one of those girls. I've heard two versions of what uh, McDonough's reply was. Yes, but how do I choose? And the other was, I'll have the beautiful one. From the photograph, you, can, you, you, you will see uh, what I meant, even though it does not show her beautiful red hair. Uh, would you like to bring the next slide, please? Regarding that photograph, after they were married, McDonough uh, came home one day and found Muriel very upset. He asked her the problem was, and she told him she spent her housekeeping money on a hat. Most husbands uh, would not have been best pleased, but McDonough's reaction was uh, asked if she liked it. She said it was lovely, and he asked her to put it on so that she, he could see it. When he saw her in it, he agreed that it was indeed lovely and that they needed to uh, have a, a, her photographed in it. That's the photograph, but I'm skipping ahead. In fact, I need to go back and tell you more about Muriel's background. Her family was very different. Her father, Frederick Gifford, was a, uh, was a, uh, worked in a legal office and was a practicing Catholic, but quite a mild man from what I've heard about him. Her mother, Isabella, was a rather forceful lady. She was the daughter of Robert Nathaniel Burton, a Church of Ireland clergyman. During the famine, he and the local parish priest used to visit together the houses of those who were dying to minister to them. If the, if the people in the house were Catholic, the parish priest would say the prayer uh, uh, for the dying and administer the last rites. If the people were Protestant, Robert Nathaniel would say the relevant prayers. Then the parish priest died of famine fever. Robert Nathaniel took his breviary and continued to say in Catholic homes to read the appropriate uh, prayers. <coughs> Excuse me. After some time, he too died. Uh, records and, uh, and law list his death as being due to diphtheria, smallpox and typhoid. Quite possibly all were involved since he was moving around among severely ill people. The end result, however, was that his diocese were not impressed that he had not tried to convert people on their deathbeds, gave no assistance to the widow and, uh, and large family, and gave them a very short time to, lead, uh, to vacate their home, which, of course, was the property of the diocese. An appeal was made for assistance for them, and money was collected to help them, and much of the assistance came from Robert Nathaniel's uh, brothers, one of whom was uh, very well known. Do you remember a few years ago, RTE had a competition to find Ireland's favorite painting? The painting that won was The Meeting in the Turret Stairs by Sir Frederick Burton. It's a glorious watercolor and gouache painting on paper. He disliked painting in oils or on canvas. It's a spectacular piece of work owned by the National Gallery here in Dublin, but it's only available to see a couple of specific hours each week as it needs to be protected from strong light lest either the paint or the paper be damaged. Frederick, one of Robert Nathaniel's brothers, was one of those who consistently gave uh, what assistance he could to his sister-in-law and nephews and nieces, despite the fact that he was uh, not all that, uh, he did not have all that much money. He was at different times director of the National Gallery in Dublin, subsequently in London. Another of his paintings is The Aaron Fisherman's Drowned Child, this catches my attention because it suggests that he visit the Aran Islands, which would make my grand grandchildren at least seventh generation to do so. However, back to the point, Isabella Burton was a very committed member of the Church of Ireland. Uh, so it is a little surprising to me that she married Frederick Gifford, a Catholic. It was customary at that time, the girls were christened in the faith of their mother and the boys in the faith of their father. However, all the children were brought up in the Church of Ireland. <coughs> I heard recently that they were all confirmed in the Church of Ireland. Though Frederick uh, remained a practicing Catholic, 
uh, despite Isabella's attempts to get him to go to, to go to church with them, he used to go to mass on his own. Jeans won out in other regards too. All the girls were redheads to some extent. Sydney, the youngest, I'm told, had brown hair with red highlights, but all the others had striking auburn hair. In the painting, The Meeting on the Turret Stairs, the woman has waist-length plait of red hair down her back. I recall two of my grand aunts, Kay and Grace, being redheads to the day they died, and I have some of Muriel's hair. The, scholar, the color skipped two generations, but my daughter's hair is the same color as Muriel's, and one of my sons has the same color as I recall Grace having in her later years. The other thing that uh, they, the family inherited was that most of them were quite good artists. We know of Grace, but all of them, in fact, uh, were very competent artists as well. Both Isabella and Frederick were quite unionist, I'm told. Isabella certainly was. I simply don't know about Frederick. So it must have been a, a cause for some controversy, excuse me, controversy when some of the girls began to display independent minds. Some of them started actively campaigning uh, uh, for um, uh, women's suffrage. And some also joined Inagina Heron in English Daughters of Ireland. This was a radical Irish nationalist women's uh, organization led and founded by Maud Gahn in 1909, a precursor of Common Naman, with which it actually merged later. An exception at that time was the eldest daughter, Catherine, Kay to us, Katie to some of the other family members. She studied at the Royal University and was conferred first with a BA and then MA in, in, in the uh, first decade of the 20th century and then worked with her father and one of her brothers as a solicitor. All of, uh, all of the others, Ada, whom I never met as she immigrated to the US quite early on, and with other members of the family would regularly um, stay if, uh, with whom, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, people, uh, family members who went to New York for whatever reason would stay with Ada, uh, Ada on an ongoing basis. And they, they did go back and forth quite an amount. Uh, in particular, um, Sydney was known as John. <clears throat> the youngsters used to have a family newspaper uh, in which they would have articles, stories, poems, and draw drawings. John, however, wanted to write professionally. There were two obstacles to this. Her parents would not have been impressed. Well, certainly Isabella, I don't know about Frederick. And it was not a suitable role for a proper young lady. And, and she had little chance of being published if newspaper editors realized she was a woman. So she used the pen name John Brennan. And before long, she was known for, uh, to all and sundry, apart from her parents, I imagine, by that name and to her preference. Uh, there's another photograph, please. There's a story supporting, supported by a photograph of Muriel and John with a great Dane dog. Apparently, they'd gone out to discourage Irishmen from joining the British Army, uh, who were recruiting rather energetically. They were armed with flyers, which they were handing out. A few times they were, to put it mildly, addressed in strong language and loud voices. Then out of the blue, this great Dane ambled up and stood between them. If someone's tone was not appropriate, the dog would growl. And since he was huge, the opposition soon stopped. I'm told the girls became quite cheeky and would roll, uh, actually roll up the flyers and push them into the barrels of rifles carried by British Army soldiers they met. When they'd passed out all of their flyers, they decided they must record the event. So they went to a, a, a photographer's studio and had a photograph taken with the dog. When they left the, the, the premises, the dog went in one direction and they in another, and they never saw him again. It was while MacDonough was teaching in St. Enders that Joe Plunkett's mother advertised for someone who, who could teach him Joe Irish, and MacDonough got the job. It would appear that they got on especially well together, and <clears throat> they became close friends and, and uh, confederates in all sorts of ways. I have little doubt that it was through MacDonough and Muriel uh, that Joe met Grace. So it was that many of the others who later became involved as leaders of the rising 
began to come together and be associated with St. Enders. Sean McDiarmid, Con Colbert, naturally Willie Pierce, as well as others. One of the problems was that the finances were not in good shape. And if there were important bills to be paid, the teachers' salaries slid down the list of priorities. As a result, when the relationship between McDonough and Muriel uh, developed and he wanted to get married, he hesitated because of concerns about supporting a wife and family. So when he was, he was offered a post as a lecturer in English in what became UCD, he took the job, though he still continued an association with St. Enders. They were married in, in, on the 3rd of January in 1912, in what was then a chapel of ease on Beechwood Avenue in, in Ranelagh, and a, a Jesuit friend of McDonough acted as a celebrant. Because Muriel was not a Catholic, they didn't have the, uh, the usual format of a nuptial mass, and they did not have a, a best man and bridesmaid. They did need to nominate a Catholic witness, and Porrick Pierce uh, was appointed to the job. Obviously, he had other things on his mind because he forgot and didn't show up for the, the wedding, and a substitute had to stand in. In November, Muriel and uh, Thomas's son, Donna, was born. You will know, I'm sure, much of, of what happened in those years leading up to the rising, including the lockout. McDonough was part of a, 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 a was a, a part of a founding group of, for a committee who tried to mediate between the workers and the employers, though he, it was not successful. Another of the Jefford sisters, Nellie, was a home economics teacher at that time, and it was she who set up the soup kitchen to provide meals uh, for the workers and for the families. And some of her sisters, I suspect again, Muriel and Grace, uh, were involved in helping both there and in city centre school where meals were provided for the children at midday. The purpose was to try to keep the children in school at a time when they might otherwise be trying to find any job they could because money was so short. Uh, next photo, oh, you have it. I think this must have been about the time that McDonough realised that peace uh, peaceful uh, moves to support Irish identity and culture would not be enough. He's quoted by Mary Cullum, a close friend and wife of Porter Cullum, another friend, as saying that all their work on the Irish language and culture would be useless if the country was in such dreadful situation economically and therefore a rising would be necessary. Nelly had other interesting roles. When he was forbidden uh, by the police from addressing uh, the lockout uh, workers at a meeting on O'Connell Street, it was she who smuggled Jim Larkin into the hotel, uh, uh, which was the upper stories of that later became Cleary's. She went in, this very demure, tiny lady, and told the receptionist that her father, a clergyman, wanted to rehearse a sermon and uh, needed a room with a balcony uh, for this. And would they show sure what he, uh, they had, please? She selected a room she thought would be best uh, for, uh, for the purpose. She then borrowed a suit, cape, and hat from Casimir Markovich. Helena Maloney, an Abbey actress, uh, supplied a false beard. They borrowed a coach from the Plunkett family and arrived at the hotel at the appointed time. Nell, and Nellie went to the reception desk and while Larkin hurried up the stairs with his, uh, the collar of the cape pulled up about his face. Once in the room, he shed the hat, uh, hat and cape and went out onto the balcony and delivered a rousing speech. Nellie held the door closed against the police when they arrived until he had finished. It was after so many people were brutalized by the police at that uh, meeting that James Connolly and Jim Larkin decided to form and train the Irish citizen army to defend their people in such situations. In later years, Nellie used to run an employment office out of uh, the office of the volunteers had on Dawson Street down at the bottom, quite close to Trinity. Uh, and when the Plunkets were looking for someone to book with bookkeeping skills to manage their complicated finances, she interviewed and sent a young man who had returned from London uh, with the outbreak of the World War uh, to meet them, uh, who it was decided they decided would fit the bill. He also became Joe Plunkett's secretary and general assistant. That was Michael Collins. In the meantime, however, the volunteers 
uh, were founded and became a huge countrywide organization. And following the Larne uh, uh, gun running, organized the, the Hoth and Kil uh, Kilcoil runs in July 1914. The difference in approach by the British government to the northern and southern events spoke volumes about how, how each group uh, would be uh, seen and treated in the future. When the war began, John Redmond and members of the Irish Parliamentary Party, who had joined the volunteers and were in important roles, it encouraged many of the members to join the British Army to defend, quote, small nations, unquote, like Belgium, whose record as a colonizing power in Africa was dreadful, as recorded by Roger Casement, who was then working for the, the British Foreign Office and saw the real situation. <coughs> the numbers of those who stayed home was considerably reduced. On 24th of March, 1915, my mother was born. A short time later, they were back in Beechwood Avenue Church for her christening. In those days, girls uh, would have at least two godmothers frequently and one godfather. Helena Maloney was certainly one of the godmothers. She signed the register, so, uh, uh, so I'm sure about her. I have heard both Dr. Kathleen Lynn and Madeleine Fench Mullen uh, state as the other. Possibly they both were. Her godfather was to be Porrick Cullum, but while they were waiting for the proceedings to start, Porrick Pierce happened to drop into the church. And I'm told, uh, Madonna said to him, well, you're three years late. Remember, he'd missed the wedding the year before, three years before, but come and stand for the, uh, the child. And so my mother acquired a second godfather. Uh, and it was Pierce who actually signed the register. Paula Cullum did stay in contact with my mother in particular and the rest of the family throughout the remainder of his life, even when he was living in New York. When O'Donovan Ross had died in June 1915, it was decided that his body would be returned to Ireland for burial, according to his wish. And it became an opportunity to have an event which would uh, concentrate people's minds and would demonstrate the nationalist identity and to some extent purpose. Tom Clark told Pierce uh, to in no way hold back on his oration over the grave, and he certainly didn't. It was a magnificent bilingual speech. It was McDonough who organized and coordinated the funeral. He was the Grand Marshal. There seems to have been an interesting reflection uh, of, of their relationship. Pierce was the, uh, the person who was in the public eye, though McDonough too uh, moved around the country speaking at meetings and recruiting. And McDonough uh, saw uh, to the practical organization. The list of those who were on the organizing committees is impressive and include many of the organizations that would later go on to take part in the rising. A group that would, uh, that would lead the rising had substantially come together. Tom Clark's tobacconist uh, shop in Parnell Street became a natural meeting place and the old Fenian had a huge influence on the group who were assembling, the volunteers, Cumann Amman, Irish Citizen Army, uh, Fianna Aaron, Hibernian Rifles, and others met and trained and drilled and learned necessary skills for when the time would come to go and fight for Irish freedom. They used covers of Cayley's and Irish language classes and even cookery classes at times uh, for their preparations for the rising. I'm sure you, you already know the sequence of events that led up to the decision to go ahead with, uh, with it. On the 16th of January, 1916, the Supreme Council of the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, who were uh, the, the more secret guiding force behind most of the, many of the organizations involved, met in what was then Clontarf Town Hall and set the date for the rising the following Easter Sunday and the actual plans started to proceed. One of those heavily involved in the planning was Joe Plunkett, despite the very, his very frail health. He frequently had to spend winters out of Ireland in, in warmer countries, but he still worked uh, consistently on plans for the rising. He and McDonough would have been the techies uh, of their time, interested in things that would, uh, would take very much for granted these days, and even in depths past. But unusual then, things like radio, for example, very revolutionary in that time. 
It was just before this, uh, this too that Joe proposed to Grace and was accepted, though they did not formally announce it. Grace knew that her mother would disapprove heartily of such a match. Joe was frail, he was Catholic, he was involved in nationalist activities. Regardless, Grace had been uh, interested in becoming a Catholic for some time, having observed the comfort that, uh, that their religion gave to many in the church. She used to visit the Pro Cathedral and noticed the, the women in particular going and praying and looking as though they felt better when they came out. They set the wedding day for Easter Sunday, uh, although Joe at least was aware uh, before long of the problems that day, uh, day would uh, raise. She was baptized in University Church in Stevens Green on the 7th of April, 1916. In those months, all the leaders were aware that they were uh, being uh, followed everywhere they went. Unless they managed to give their tails a, a slip, they'd go in the front of, of a building and then out through the back and the person who would follow them wouldn't be able to, to go in too. Their homes were also being watched. Then a friendly source in Dublin Castle saw a document which showed uh, that there was a plan in place to round them all up, jail them and deport them. As a result, uh, during at least the week before the rising, whilst they visited their homes at times, none of them spent the nights there. When a transcript of the document compiled from memory was smuggled out, it was brought to Joe, who was in a nursing home, having just had some surgery near, near Parnell Square. He took the uh, document, didn't say that this was exactly what a, uh, uh, the document from the castle, but said that the, the, the contents were uh, that. Um, he embellished it a bit, we're told, and passed it to the other leaders. It said that Grace actually transcribed it at his dictation. At that time, people like Owen McNeil, who, uh, who was the commander in chief of the volunteers and Bulmer Hobson had been strongly against the idea of a rising because they saw it as doomed to failure because of the supply of arms was very limited. Roger Casement had traveled to Germany and purchased arms and ammunition and was bringing them on a ship, the Oud, uh, to be landed in Kerry and distributed uh, uh, around the country. With the British heavily involved in the War of Europe, uh, uh, with a threat of conscription, which had been proposed in the British uh, Parliament, with arms on the way and with a real threat that all the leadership of the organization being lifted MacNeil was persuaded, persuaded that English, England's difficulty was Ireland's opportunity and that the rising should go ahead as planned. <coughs> Excuse me. Then when word came the out had been scuttled, completed, uh, complete with the arms to avoid arrest by British uh, ships and the and casement was arrested, MacNeil had a complete turnaround. Uh, again, the other leaders were all determined to go ahead as planned, but he sent messengers all around the country and cancelled orders and even advertised in the Sunday Independent with instructions that all, quote, route marches, unquote. The, co co uh, the cover for assembling the, the volunteers was cancelled. The result was chaotic. I've heard that most of the leaders of the Dublin leaders were assembled in Liberty Hall and were in a state of complete depression everything they had planned for was scuttled. Because of the document from the castle, they knew their time as free men and women was uh, numbered. <coughs> Into the middle of this, <coughs> this, McDonough bounced and asked what the problem was. When told that McNeil had uh, canceled the rising at the last moment, his response was, well, we couldn't go today. We'll go tomorrow instead. And so they did. They set to to print the proclamation which they had prepared during the previous week <coughs> and worked all night to have it, it, it ready in the morning to be uh, pasted up around the city. And on Easter Monday morning, the 24th of April, they went out and took up positions in the different garrisons. They had planned to take the city centre, so the GPO was obvious, an obvious defensible position. They had also selected places like the South Dublin Union, part of which is now St. James Hospital because it would block passage into the city from Royal Hospital Kilmainham. Boland's Mills commanded part of the Dockland 
and the roads into Dublin from the south. A, a group was set to take, uh, take the Mendicity Institution to have those in the four, uh, to uh, give those in the four courts and the GPO time to get established. They were meant to hold it for three hours, but stayed instead for three days. The four courts area, including the Father Matthew Hall, was an important area because it was the route for soldiers from the barracks to the west, one of which uh, is what is now the National Museum at Collins Barracks, and the, uh, the area of Church Street, Smithfield and North King Street, uh, and they were very effective. A group from that garrison went to the Phoenix Park to scavenge for arms and ammunition, I beg your pardon, ammunition in the magazine fort there, but didn't find anything substantial. Michael Mallon and Constance Markovich led their group of Irish citizen army people, which included Nelly, to St. Stephen's Green and dug in. <coughs> their intention had been to, uh, to take the tall buildings at each corner, but didn't have enough uh, people to do so. So they dug into the green instead. Later, when they found the uh, position was not uh, could not be defended properly, they decamped to the Royal College of Surgeons and got in simply by knocking on the door. The porter was expecting one of the senior surgeons to go in to do some work and answered when he heard knocking and the door was pushed wide and, and they fired, uh, so they uh, walked in as so it was open. McDonough had been appointed to take the Jacob's Biscuit Factory at Bishop Street. It was a huge complex with what were then the tallest towers in Dublin, excellent sliding positions, particularly into Dublin Castle. It also commanded the route uh, into the city for, our, for the army uh, barracks in Rath Mines. Uh, when the British army saw that, uh, that they had Jacobs, they barely came near the place because they knew that it would take a huge operation to uh, defeat the garrison. I'm sure you know the rest of what happened that week. The main rising was in Dublin, though there, were, there was action in Enniscorthy and Ashburn in North County Dublin and in Nathan Rye. Because of O'Neill's uh, commanding order in the volunteers in those parts of the country uh, assembled, there were in many cases uh, just sent home. In a few places, the, uh, there would have been no point starting anything because they, they didn't have any arms. In others, uh, the local commanders felt that they needed to do what O'Neill had ordered. Remember, there was an, uh, no communication, radio, television, uh, so, excuse me, uh, in those days, and there were uh, newspapers with the, uh, the, which uh, were far from um, sympathetic uh, for communication was um, uh, patchy at the best. At any time, the insurgents did not seriously think that they would uh, defeat uh, that their insurrection against uh, the might of the British Empire. I have the impression that uh, they hoped that they could, could hold out for maybe uh, if the whole country arose for a month. The leaders knew that they, uh, their part, uh, the part they followed uh, was, uh, sorry, sorry, my, my, my voice is going, um, uh, th that they were effectively dead men, but they hoped that in a, peace conference after the war, they would be represented. When heavy artillery and uh, incendiaries were used on O'Connell Street uh, and the uh, garrison had to move and uh, the burning GPO, they hoped to, to move to, uh, to the next, uh, next planned uh, position, which was the Williams and Woods factory on Great Denmark's, uh, Great Britain Street, now Parnell Street. Uh, they left a, a side door of the GPO, James Connolly, who had been wounded, uh, was, uh, was, was carried on a stretcher uh, and um, they headed down Henry Place and L-shaped lane, uh, which would come out on uh, to Moore Street. They were under heavy fire uh, from a machine gun at the uh, junction of Moore Lane and um, Great Britain Street. They erected a barricade uh, to get past, 
but still some were killed uh, from, uh, or wounded uh, at this point. When they reached Moore Street uh, again under um, intense fire, uh, they um, decided to break out uh, a wall area under a window so that they would have access into number 10 uh, and then get through the houses. While they were breaking, you can still see uh, the, the area that they broke in uh, under uh, the, the outline of a window. While they were doing that, Jack Plunkett, one of Joe's brothers, heard moaning in a lane across uh, uh, Moore Street. And they had a barricade uh, between uh, the laneway and Moore Street, but he hopped over, ran across, and he found, they thought that it was one of their own people, uh, but it wasn't, it was a British soldier who was wounded. So he, slung, uh, Jack slung the man over his shoulder, brought him back and handed him back over the uh, barricade to be cared for uh, with other wounded uh, volunteers. He then turned around to go back and said, what did they say? What are you doing? And he said, his rifle's there, we need it. And he went back, got the rifle and came back over the, uh, the barrier. Um, during that night, they broke through from house to house at different levels, all the way down to number 25, which is uh, the, which was the building at, uh, at the corner of what's now O'Rahilly Parade. They settled on number 16 as the command post uh, because it was in the middle of the terrace, but all the houses as well as the yards and outhouses were occupied by approximately 300 men of the uh, volunteers Irish Citizens Army and the three women who had accompanied them. The rest of the women and the Fianna boys had been told to go home from the GPO, but Winifred Carney Connolly's secretary, who'd gone into the GPO with her typewriter and a Webley revolver, Elizabeth O'Farrell and Ju Julia Grennan had stayed with the group. Then on the 30th of April, Pierce was standing at a first floor window looking out uh, onto Moore Street when he saw a family of uh, you know, a father, a mother and some children who had lived on Moore Lane carrying a white flag when the father was shot dead right in front of him. It had always been their uh, stated intention to avoid civilian uh, involvement as much as possible, but he recognized that they must now surrender to stop further civilian bloodshed. The rest, I'm sure you know. The other leaders uh, were pers uh, in um, Moore Street were per persuaded that surrender was necessary. <coughs> and then the rest of the garrison was informed of the decision. Elizabeth O'Farrell went out in number 15, holding a white flag in front of her and walked slowly to the barricade. At first she was treated as a spy, but when General Lowe uh, was informed of what she ha had to say, he met with her. She said she had come to ask for terms uh, for the surrender. And, uh, as, and, as told, uh, and was told that, they, um, that it would be unconditional only. A ceasefire was called and she returned later with Pierce. She then, she was then subsequently after the uh, uh, Pierce, you will have seen, I'm sure, the famous photograph. She was then driven around the city, getting as close as was viable to, uh, to some of the garrisons and then walking the rest of the way uh, with the order to surrender. At first, McDonough refused to accept the order since Pierce was now a uh, prisoner. But after some communication with some of the leaders in the other garrisons, he too accepted. He, had, he met with uh, General Lowe in St. Patrick's uh, Park, uh, said he would surrender and handed him his gun, then went back to tell the garrison. Many didn't want to give up and wanted to fight on, but he said that they all had to obey orders. One of the orders he gave was that anyone not in uniform was to leave by a back window and go home. Uh, when there were again objections, he told them that he and the other leaders would be gone. He knew that they would not survive uh, and that those who left it would be needed to carry on the cause. Uh, most of the prisoners uh, were taken to um, Richmond Barracks. The courts marshaled to a place starting with Tom Clark, Porrick Pierce and Thomas McDonough. They were all condemned to death and transferred to Kilmainham Jail. 
Tom Clark and Paula Pierce uh, did have visits from their family. But when Muriel tried to visit, she couldn't get uh, through barricades because she didn't have, she hadn't been given a pass. McDonough's sister, Mary McDonough's sister Francesca, did visit him and took a clipping of his hair as a souvenir. Uh, while they did receive a, a visit from a priest, they were denied a um, right to uh, be anointed after their death. Sorry to keep you. Uh, while they did really have uh, and they were shot at uh, dawn on the 3rd of May. <coughs> Around midnight, Maxana uh, was given two sheets of paper uh, to write on. He began to write a statement, but then was told that he could only write uh, a letter. He asked for another page, and but this was refused, so he had to continue with uh, the original, uh, the same document. That is currently in the last words part of Kilmainham Jail. Joe Plunkett, along with Willie Pierce, Ned Daly, who is Thomas Clark's uh, brother-in-law, Michael O'Halloran, were due to, uh, to be shot on the morning of 4th of May. Joe managed to obtain permission to marry Grace in the chapel in Kilmainham that night. Um, Grace was brought uh, to the jail, but left to wait for quite a while uh, before being brought to the chapel. Joe was brought in, his hands tied behind his back. His hands were then released and the, uh, the uh, ceremony took place. And his hands were retied. They were not allowed to say anything else at that time. Uh, and they were immediately separated again. Grace was brought by the priest who had performed the wedding to a house for a uh, rest. But was called back to the jail at 2 a.m. when they were told they had 10 minutes one so a soldier stopped with a pocket watch in his hand so as to count off the seconds and to make sure they didn't have a moment longer. The rest of the cell was crowded with armed soldiers. In the circumstances, neither of them was ready to uh, say anything personal. Then she was taken away again and, uh, and he was shot a couple, literally a couple of hours later. Later that day, Grace went to her family home and the door was opened by her mother. Grace told her that she had married Joe Plunk the night before in the jail and he'd been shot that morning. Her mother closed the door in her face. Nellie was a prisoner in Kilmainham at the time. She didn't know anything about uh, her sister's wedding or that her two brothers-in-law uh, were executed those two mornings and Grace had no idea that Nellie was there. And so the executions went on, then the deportations not only of those who had taken part in the rising, but of many who simply suspected of being sympathetic. Uh, they had a number of, of effects. Sympathy for the rebels began to rise, and those who were jailed or interned in places like Frongok were educated in nationalism. The camp was subsequently nicknamed the University of Revolution. <coughs> and was a training ground that la uh, laid the seeds uh, for the War of Independence. Back in Ireland, with their men either dead or, or jailed, the women, led by Kathleen Clark, stepped up to the mark. They raised money to help the families of those who, uh, who had died or been jailed, and the men who had uh, returned from jail when, that, when they were released. Muriel was very involved in this, and uh, photographs of her with her small children were used uh, in material distributed in America in particular uh, to garner sympathy and support. And in this photograph, you will see that uh, Barbara has a black sash around her dress, as was felt appropriate uh, for a child whose father had been killed. In July 1917, it was decided the families of those executed ought to have a holiday uh, because they had been through so much in the previous year and two houses uh, were rented in Skerries. Muriel didn't want to go. Don had been ill and she'd been uh, nursing him. 
she was persuaded that she could be he could be cared for in a hospital for a couple of weeks. Uh, but if she did not go, Grace would not either. And Grace really needed the break too. So she agreed. The Collins, Connollys, the Mallons, and I think the McDermott's were there at the same time. They had put up a small tent on the beach and had a tricolor beside it. This was because there was a, an election coming up and there were a lot of Union Jacks along the wall beside, behind the beach. Two RIC came along and to, uh, took, the tri, uh, took the tricolour down. They were walking away with it, but Grace ran after them and uh, made them give it back. She brought it back and Muriel decided that it would not uh, so easily get it and uh, planned to swim to an island off, uh, off the coast. Others tried to dissuade her, but she was determined. She tried a couple of days later, but had to turn back. She sent a postcard to Don about it. Then she tried again one evening. However, there was a very strong and very cold current, and she was caught in it. The ebb had just turned, the, the, um, the tide had just turned from full to ebb, and it ran at, at six knots. When people in the beach realized that she was in trouble, they looked for a boat. There was, uh, there was one, but there were no oars in it. And when they went to the house of the owners, the oars were refused by a, a servant. By the time other boats were launched, there was no sign of her, though some people searched all night. Her body was washed up ashore some distance away the next morning. The post-mortem showed that she had died of heart failure brought on by exhaustion. And we will probably say hypothermia too these days. So she fought until her heart gave out. When the body was brought back to Dublin um, uh, for, the, for her funeral, by train, it was met by a huge contingent of sympathizers who accompanied her to her home in Donnybrook. The next day, the cortege uh, from her home to the Pro Cathedral was stated in a newspaper uh, report as four miles long, and the streets the whole way were lined with people. After her requiem mass, uh, there was again a huge cortege to uh, Glasnevin Cemetery, and the streets the whole way uh, were lined with people paying their respects. It demonstrated that people, people's sympathies had now swung behind those who had gone out to fight for the country's uh, freedom, and that the rising, after all, had not failed in its purpose to keep the thirst for independence alive. Thanks a million, Muriel. I'm just going to put my camera back on. Wow. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Wow, what a tragedy. What a tragedy for your family. You know, especially uh, it, Muriel, it after the children. other. It was very tough on the children. Now, initially, they were cared for by uh, Kay and Grace. But things that's, that's a whole other story. I would recommend, by the way, for anyone who's interested in the, fam in the Gifford family, Marita Conlon and McKenna wrote Rebel Sisters. And she spent two and a half years going through all the papers in the National Library to make sure she had it right. Yes. Gosh. But, uh, and, and before we, we open to questions, I'd just like to say thanks a million for doing this for, it, for us. Um, it's so fascinating how all the different characters you'll hear are, are key people, not characters. Francis Sheehy, Skeffington, Jim Larkin, all tie in with your family to, you oh, know, yeah you know, a, a very much a circle back then, a circle all with the same motivation, you know, yeah. fascinating. Well, Fra Frank Sheehy Skeffington did not want an arm drive. Yes, yes. And a letter, an open letter to McDonough about it. But, but, the, but it didn't stop them being friends. And yes. I mean, what happened, what happened to him too was a, a very, very major tragedy. He yes. was out trying to stop people looting when he was arrested and brought to uh, a barri oh, barracks. Rathmines mm. hmm? yeah. barracks, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, and um, it, it, it was he and two, and then he and two journalists were used as cover for uh, a party going out. And then they were just stood against a wall in the barracks and shot in cold blood with no yes. authorization. Yes. 
Yes, and I don't think even that officer, I think he ended up in Canada. I don't think he yes, ever he got there. Um, he was, he was arrested. He was court-martialed. They said he did it while the balance of his mind was disturbed. Mm. He'd, he'd been in France and he was, he did have psychiatric problems. But then we decided, oh, well, he's better now, so he, we will release him. Mm. And he went to Canada. Yes. yes. And moving back, before I open to questions, Muriel, and what are yes. your own thoughts of your grandmother swimming out with the flag? Um, I can see where she was coming from. Now, I'm, I, she was a very good swimmer. She was an exceptionally good swimmer. The first time she tried, uh, she didn't manage it. They, there were people who say she didn't have the flag with her on the 9th of July when she, when she actually died. But she certainly was determined she was going to put that up on that island. And they could like it or lump it. Mm. And actually, on the centenary of her death, we had ceremonies in Skerries. And there were a group who went out on, at the, the appropriate time, in low tide, there's a causeway out to the island and they went out and hoisted the flag for her a hundred years later. Wow. And would that yeah. be Shenick? Shenick. Shenick. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Wow. Because of the Motel Tower. Yes. The, reason, the reason I know that was uh, Father Joe Mallon, Michael Mallon's son, was there. And he was aware of the whole, he was very aware of the whole situation. And he told me, I didn't know which of the islands it was until he told me. Right. So right. that, that was a very right. special. Okay. Yes, indeed. Lo a, a lovely, a lovely man. Yes, indeed. And so Mira, thank you very much. Um, I just appreciate the time you put in. Lovely photograph, which we would ask people not to copy. Um, and. A, a wonderful um, in-depth look at the time through your family's eyes, which is wonderful. Um, would anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Perhaps uh, ask it, Beverly, I'm not quite sure how you manage this normally, is it through the chat? Well, yeah, uh, I was just going to say, we, I've, I've allowed people to unmute themselves. So you could either ask a question directly, or if you put it in the chat, we'll, we'll ask it for you, whatever you prefer. Lots of nice compliments in the chat as well for you, Muriel. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A lot along with the box, which I didn't actually realise was showing. So apologies for that. No. Um, a question from Johnny. Did Professor David Houston keep in touch with the family? No. He was, uh, he was meant to look, I think he kept in touch with Muriel initially because he would have been involved in the publication of literature in Ireland and the lyrical poems. Uh, but no, not, so I never knew anything about him subsequently. I, and I mean, I met so many different people. Oh, the cigarette. No, he didn't have a cigarette. When he was brought out to the, execu to the Stonebreaker's yard, um, he had a cigarette case and he realized that the young group of soldiers uh, who had been brought in to shoot him were actually very nervous. So he went over and he offered them the cigarettes from his case and saying, look, you, you're, you're doing what you have to do. And he then uh, gave the case to the officer and said, I shan't need this anymore. And that was told by the officer to, it was recorded by the officer. But he didn't, he didn't have a cigarette, but the soldiers in his execution party did. Yes. Yes. And just while we're waiting for other questions there, um, we, were, we were talking just before we, we let everyone in about his connection to Francis Ledwidge, the poet. So there was, again, another oh, yes. link to an important person of the time. Well, um, Lord Dunsany, when, Liam, uh, when McDonough was lecturing in UCD, uh, Lord D Dunsany suggested to Ledwidge that he make contact with McDonough for advice on his writing. And they were actually good friends. Mm. 
and um, at the time when word of the uh, at the time of the rising, Ledwich was actually in Liverpool on leave, and tried to come back to join, and wasn't allowed on a ship. And then once it was over, there's word of him walking along the keys, wringing his hands and saying, oh no, they shot McDonough. Mm. And that he was very, very sad about it. Yes. And in and, fact, I think he got into trouble. Didn't and, he get court-martialed himself because of the a fracas with his superior and he got sent up to the north, I believe. I don't, I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah. Actually, the uh, his lament, uh, references many of McDonough's own poems. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's, a, there's a, you mean the one on we, you shall not hear the bittern cry in the wild sky where he is lain. That internal rhyme was very much McDonough. You know, our voices of the sweeter birds, again, another of his poems against the wailing of the rain. Nor shall he know when loud march blows through la uh, France and uh, slanting snows are fan fresh shrill, turning to flame the golden cup of an inupset daffodil. But when the dark cow leaves the moor and passes poor with uh, greedy weeds, perhaps he'll hear her low at morn, lifting her horn in pleasant meads. So mm. it, it was very, it's very reflective. Mm. And the nature as well. The nature oh, yes. The, Edward always includes. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever been to Clock Jordan, but there's a lovely wood. Oh, there's a gorgeous wood. And some of the surrounding countryside is very special. And you were mentioning earlier, um, before the talk, that there's a statue to Thomas McDonough in Black Jordan, but in civilian yes. gear. Is there any reason why it's civilian clothes? There was great discussion as to whether they would put him in uniform or in civvies. And the agreement in the end, there is a photograph of McDonough, which I own, and there are prints of it around the place, on a beach in Greystones. And that was used, actually, probably taken by Muriel, uh, as a model for what, what he wore. Yeah. Apart from the fact that he's got shoes and socks on, which he didn't in, uh, in the beach. Yeah. Um, and then <clears throat> to balance that, to have the army element or the, the volunteer element, his hat on the ground in front of him. Yeah. It's, yeah. It is actually a superb uh, statue done by uh, Mark Rode who um, he's an Australian born living in Mayo. And the, what he is holding is actually a print of uh, the proclamation. Very interesting. And yes. there's a, a, a comment there from Mary um, that McDonough was a founding member of the ASTI who yes. sent a medal in recognition of service to some retiring members. Gosh, I didn't yeah. know that at all. No. When he was in Formoy, teachers at that stage didn't have any security of tenure. So they could be dismissed for no reason <clears throat> very easily. And he and some of the others, when, when this happened to one of his colleagues, see, he and some of his others founded ASTI so as to give, to gather the secondary school teachers together and give them some sort of backup. Very good. And um, would anyone else like to, to ask a question if if in, if they don't want to put in the chat? They've all gone quiet. <laughs> gone shy. No, I, no I just I, I I just found an, uh, on my other computer. I've just found a uh, <laughs> photo of that statue. I'll uh, put it up on the uh, page for the event uh, later on. Yeah. Uh, if anyone quite has amazing. The, yeah. if anyone has that centenary book that Ronan McGreevy uh, produced in uh, 2017, uh, there's a there is actually a photograph of um, Matthew holding McDonough's hand, just the two hands. I can I, I can send you a print of those, a print of that. Or if, even if you wanted to email something to me, um, Muriel, I can add it to the event That's where fine. you were able to see the members and the, the topic. I can attach it like a photo up there. Sure, yeah. I'll, I'll need to make uh, to ask the photographer if if I may do that. Yeah. I don't think she'll object, but that's another matter yeah. entirely. Thank you very much. That's very good. Um, 
So if any any last questions, if not, I think we give your voice a rest. You, you've been talking for the perfect length of time. We've just gone 10 past nine. Um, a very, very, um, a lot to read. So I'm sure your voice is feeling it now. It comes and goes, but it does at any time. And any last questions, anybody? Nobody had questions in chat. No, no. just compliments. <laughs> I think I think then we we will just uh, maybe Beverly at this stage and again apologies because usually um Jer would host at this stage of the evening we want to open the conversation to beyond this topic or wrap up for the night what would you like me to 